Hi everyone and welcome back to the A-Level English Language channel. Now, as requested, today's video is part two on my series of how to write up a comparison answer when comparing text in an exam. Now, if you haven't watched my previous video on how to write the introductory paragraph, I would recommend you do so before watching this one as this is a continuation from that one. So the two key things I'll be covering today are what should you be looking for in an unseen text and then how do you write about what you have found. Now in the last video I discussed the idea of using maps as a good place to start your analysis and focus your introduction on and as a quick reminder most of the answers to what the mode, who the audience is and what the purpose of the text is and the subject matter can usually be found in these introductory paragraphs so make sure that you do read those before you start your answer. As another quick reminder, in the last video, I pinpointed down the three things examiners, regardless of what exam board you're with, are looking to see in your answers. And they are comparing and making connections between texts, use of subject terminology, and perceptive links to context. And today's video is really going to focus in on how we find these in a text when we are reading it, and then how we effectively write up our ideas into concise but detailed paragraphs. I'm going to be using the same two texts I looked at in the last video, just so we can see how a full answer ties together. So these were both taken from a previous A-level exam, and I'm gonna start by just reading through the text quickly. And as I do, I want you to start thinking about what language points you might be able to pick out from this text to say something about. So this is text A. This is an extract from an article published in the Roswell Daily Record on Tuesday, July 8th, 1947. It's based on the report issued by the RAAF, Roswell Army Airfield, after a UFO allegedly crashed at the site in New Mexico, USA. Then we have the title, RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. No details of flying disc are revealed. The intelligence office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. According to information released by the department, over authority of Madge J.A. Marcel, intelligence officer, the disc was recovered on a ranch in the Roswell vicinity after an unidentified rancher had notified Sheriff Geo Wilcox here that he had found the instrument on his premises. Major Marcel and a detail from his department went to the ranch and recovered the disc, it was stated. After the intelligence officer here had inspected the instrument, it was flown to a higher headquarters. The intelligence office stated that no details of the source's construction or its appearance had been revealed. Mr. and Mrs. Dan Wilmot apparently were the only persons in Roswell who saw what they thought was a flying disc. They were sitting on their porch at 105 South Penn last Wednesday night at about 10 o'clock when a large glowing object zoomed out of the sky from the southeast going in a northwesterly direction at the high rate of speed. Wilmot called Mrs. Wilmot's attention to it and both ran down into the yard to watch. It was in sight less than a minute, perhaps 40 or 50 seconds, Wilmot estimated. Wilmot said that it appeared to him to be about 1,500 feet high and going fast. He estimated between 400 and 500 miles per hour. In appearance, it looked oval in shape like two inverted saucers, face mouth to mouth, or like two old type wash bowls placed together in the same fashion. The entire body glowed as though light was showing through from inside, though not like it would be if a light were underneath. From where he stood, Wilmot said that the object looked to be about five feet in size and making allowance for the distance it was from town, he figured that it must have been 15 to 20 feet in diameter, though this was just a guess. Wilmot said that he heard no sound, but that Mrs. Wilmot said she heard a swishing sound for a very short time. The object came into view from the southeast and disappeared over the treetops in the general vicinity of Six Mile Hill. Wilmot, who is one of the most respected and reliable citizens in town, kept the story to himself, hoping that someone else would come out and tell about having seen one, but finally today decided that he would go ahead and tell about it. The announcement that the RAAF was in possession of one came only a few minutes after he decided to release the details of what he had seen. So with a text like this, I often see students panic a bit, as on a first reading there aren't any really obvious uses of language that you can analyse and pick out, like similes or metaphors. But that's what makes this an A-level text rather than a GCSE-level text. 
as it's making you work a bit harder to find the interesting things. And there are definitely interesting things in here. So never panic if you feel that way. Read the text again, and then if you still can't spot things, start to think about what the writer or the speaker thinks about the topic and what they want the audience to think as well. And that's what I've highlighted here. Now, the article starts by telling us what Roswell Army Airfield have said and almost dramatises the event, which makes sense given the genre. But something I might focus on instead, as it's more subtle and perhaps give a, gives us more of an insight into what the writer actually thinks, is the use of tentative language when the writer discusses what the couple, Mr and Mrs Wilmot, have said about the object. As one could argue, the writer here is slightly sceptical about what the couple think they saw. Even looking here at the introduction to the text, you have the phrase allegedly crashed. Then if we start to look a bit deeper, look at all the noun phrases used to describe the object. So we've got flying saucer, flying disc, large glowing object, you could definitely make a comment on that. Then we have this paragraph here. Mr and Mrs Dan Wilmot apparently were the only persons in Roswell who saw what they thought was a flying disc. The use of the adverb apparently and the adjective only for the only persons is almost a subtle way, I think, of the author saying we only have their word for it, followed up by that verb phrase, what they thought, almost saying they could be very wrong. So although it's not outwardly stated, there is a sense of mistrust there coming from the writer. Continuing with that point, we've got the verb estimated used twice here, which again makes the information about the flying saucer or whatever it is seem not particularly reliable. And then again, we've got the noun guess being used, which altogether creates this semantic field of doubt and scepticism, which is definitely something you could talk about in detail. However, then we have this last paragraph and you've got the phrase Wilmot, who is one of the most respected and reliable citizens in town, kept the story to himself. And it almost goes against all of that. And then it leads us to think, well, if he's the most respected and reliable citizen in town, then he's not someone who would just make something up or misread something completely. And then this leads into the last point that says the announcement that the RAAF was in possession of one came only a few minutes after he decided to release the details of what he had seen which then makes it appear as if they're covering something up. And then you ask yourself, well, why would an article end on a cliffhanger like that? Well, it's a good story. It makes it seem like it might be a topic that they report on again. It could be another reason, uh, but these are all points that you can link then again back to the genre of the text as a newspaper article, which of course has a massive impact on the way it's been written. So I've just written up a few more points that I might focus on in this article. The first one being the use of discourse markers used throughout to structure the report and to help it sound like a newspaper. The second one is the overall tone and language used being quite formal and factual. And I've said here that the reason that this is the case is that the main purpose of the text is to inform people of what's happened. And so that's why we have this formal language use. It's very different to the second text we'll look at because the main purpose of that one is to entertain. Finally, I have the point that really when you read this, there are no low frequency Lexis words. The descriptions are quite simple. For example, when they compare the object to looking like two flying wash bowls. And the reason for that comes back to the audience. It's a local newspaper article and therefore the language needs to be accessible to everyone. So this is just an example of some of the other points you could make. And it might be that you interweave them with your main language points rather than dedicating a whole paragraph to each but it shows how much you can actually get out of this piece of text. So now, just like we did with text A, let's have a quick read of text B before we start to look at what we can pick out to analyse. So we've got the introduction. This is a transcript of a podcast discussing the transfer of files on UFO sightings from the Ministry of Defence to the National Archives. From ghost rockets in Scandinavia to mysterious fears tracked over Eritrea, the past masters team look at the records of unidentified flying objects held at the National Archives and ask, is the truth in here? The Ministry of Defence is now transferring files on UFOs to the National Archives covering 1978-2002. So, Bob. Hi there, you're listening to Past Masters from the National Archives in London. I'm Bob. And I'm Joe. Bob. And this month, we're looking at one of the strangest sets of records that we have here at the Archives, the British government's very own X-Files. Joe. 
mysterious lights in the sky, unexplained radar traces, reports from military sources and members of the public and official government policy on UFOs from the old Air Ministry, the Ministry of Defence, the Foreign Office and the Admiralty. Bob, and why are we looking at this? Joe, because it's a fascinating insight into the workings of government and its secret files and aliens. How good is that? Bob, I think that they're unexplained aerial phenomena, aren't they? Where's the evidence they're aliens? Joe. Now, scepticism is very healthy, but I think when you've heard some of these documents, you might not be so sure. Bob. I think that's very unlikely. What have you got? Joe. We've got dozens of files containing carefully kept records of hundreds of sightings. Bob. How far back do they go? Joe. Well, the British government first begins watching the skies in the first decade of the 20th century. Bob. Looking out for German airships before the First World War. Joe. That's right. Bob. Well, since they went on to bomb cities up and down Britain in 1915, that sounds very sensible, but it's nothing to do with aliens. What else have you got? Joe. Oh, OK. World War Two. Throughout the war, British and American pilots report seeing strange patterns of light on bombing ruins over Germany. Bob. Like the lights you get on an aircraft. Joe. Well, sort of, but Bob. That's another mystery solved then. I'm getting good at this. I would say that on reading this, you might find this text slightly easier to analyse than the first one. And hopefully you can already start to see some of the places where you might compare the two. So I've started again by highlighting some of the key things I would pick out to discuss. And like with the first text, I would focus my analysis around the viewpoints of the speakers. And here we have two very obvious uses of speakers being used as opposites for entertainment value. So we have Joe who is taking on the very excited let's talk about aliens theories role and we've got Bob who is taking on the sceptical cynical kind of approach to that and there may be some comparisons you can make between the way that Bob speaks here and the way the writer in text A writes. So let's start by looking at Joe. We've got his use of hyperbole here where he talks about its secret files on aliens. How good is that? And, you know, you've got that as an exclamatory sentence, which you could talk about. You've got the kind of use of rhetorical question as well. Um, and we've got Bob as well using questions throughout the text. So you've got him saying, you know, what have you got? And what have you got again here? Why are we looking at this? And I would argue that he's using these as discourse markers to help structure the text and keep that back and forth of those adjacency pairs going between the two speakers. And... Then I've also highlighted that you've got these sort of very blunt declarative statements that Bob uses. So it's nothing to do with aliens. And I think that's very unlikely, which, you know, all adds to that idea that his voice is coming through as very sceptical. And then it contrasts even more to Joe's very excited voice for comic effect. And again, we can link that back to the purpose in particular. This is a podcast. And yes, you could argue that one of its functions is to inform. But I would say that the main function is going to be to entertain, which is probably why they set these two speakers up to be so opposite in their views. And the final thing I've highlighted here is you've got a couple of uses of spoken language just at the end. Uh, you've got Joe saying, oh, OK, these minor sentences, uh, maybe highlighting his disappointment in the way that Bob is speaking about, you know, what he's trying to tell him that he thinks is really excited probably scripted I would argue this is um, and then again you've got Joe sort of interrupting Bob here with you know well sort of but and then Bob's that that's another mystery solved then and again it could be that that all of that is scripted on purpose however it all feeds into the genre and the purpose of the piece as well so as before I've just noted down a few more points of analysis you might want to pick out the first one is an extension to the points I've just been talking about, but focusing specifically on the childish language used by Joe, like when he says it's secret files on aliens. How cool is that? Which is a direct contrast to the way that Bob then speaks. Then we have another contrast to text one where we discussed how the Lexus used was very easy to understand. Here, I would argue that you actually have quite specific terms being used, such as the X-Files and the Ministry of Defence. They're mentioned, but they're not explained, which shows that they're expecting their audience to already know what these things are. Then finally, something that kind of ties the two texts together. Again, maybe not a point I would expand on too much, 
but it might be quite a nice one to add into a conclusion or if it fits the end of one of your main points is that both texts have this feeling of information being released after potentially being covered up previously, which links to the overall subject matter for both. Here I've written up a model paragraph, and now this definitely isn't as long or as detailed as you would need it to be for a full answer, but hopefully it will show you where I'm hitting the exam criteria and how I've used what I've spotted and written it into clear points. I've highlighted any subject terminology that I've used in purple, any comparison between the two texts in yellow, and any perceptive links to context in green. Although it's not outwardly stated by the writer, one could argue there is a sense of scepticism in text A on what they are reporting on, as seen through the use of tentative language. We are told that Mr and Mrs Dan Wilmot apparently were the only persons in Roswell who saw what they thought was a flying disc. The use of the adverb apparently is interesting, as it shows a lack of belief from the writer, which is emphasised further with the verb phrase, what they thought. As this is a newspaper article, there is a need for a balanced view, particularly considering it is a local newspaper and therefore unlikely to be aligned politically or otherwise. This is a direct contrast to text B, where both speakers are very open and perhaps even hyperbolic in their feelings towards the British government's very own X-Files, with one speaker, Joe, taking on an excited, almost childlike role through exclamatory sentences such as its secret files on aliens. In comparison to Bob's cynical declaratives, I think that's very unlikely. This adds to the light-hearted humour of the podcast, feeding into its purpose of entertaining and allows Bob's statements and questions to work as discourse markers to help structure the piece and make the back and forth adjacency pairs seem natural, even though they are likely to have been planned in advance. Hopefully, if you've watched video one, although I have realised that I've changed around which text is text A and which is text B, so apologies for that. But you can see how this paragraph would fit quite nicely after that introduction. If there was any subject terminology I used in this video that you're not comfortable with, please have a look at the rest of my channel, as this should help you with that. And thank you again for watching.